This week's On Story, the producer and showrunner of CBS's hit comedy series Ghosts, Joe Wiseman. These are ghosts, but we also want them to play as humans. We want, we want people to relate to them as human beings, which they probably philosophically are, and, you know, that have feelings and wants and all that stuff. I think that was something great that the, the British series did, is they decided not to have their ghosts be translucent or floating or whatever. It's like they're, they're people. This week on On Story, producer and showrunner Joe Wiseman discusses his work behind the American adaptation of the BBC hit comedy series Ghosts. Wiseman deep dives into the art of adaptation, finding the perfect cast, and the process of recreating the story for an American audience. This is 100% the most incredible moment of my life, so far from my wedding. It's all ours. What did that girl just say? She must be related to you. Like a niece. A great, great, great... No, 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 no. She's no niece of mine. Look at her. She's exposing her knees, and she's got a tattoo. How did the prospect of the project even land or, or come about? Obviously being a pre-existing show uh, currently airing across the pond. Joe and I had, about five years ago, written a pilot that did not get shot. It was called Eternally Yours. And it was based on vampires who had been, a couple of, uh, who had been married for 500 years and were really sick of each other. In our vampire lore, divorce was not an option, so you, they were literally stuck in it. And, Joe Port painfully points out that it was it was an analogy for his and I sort of contractually obligated relationship that seemed to have just kept going and going and going. The pilot did not get shot. So, you know, the official scorecard, it was a failure. However, when Ghost came around, CBS was familiar with us and they remembered, oh, remember uh, Joe and Joe wrote that, that uh, vampire. And so to them, it was like, oh, they, they can write genre comedy. Let's take their temperature and see if they like this. So uh, they sent us uh, a link to the BBC show, which I was uh, unfamiliar with. And I don't know if you could get it in the States at that time. You can now. The BBC version is fantastic. You should absolutely check it out. It's on HBO Max. Uh, also check out the American version. <laughs> <laughs> and I watched the first five minutes. I was like, I'm in. Wow. Unbelievable. Well, they seem really nice. Let's give them a chance. Yeah. Oh, look at that. No. Oh. Is that late? Why eat it when that happens? It's a lake. Well, there's only two of them. Still plenty of room for us. This is going to make one incredible hotel. <gasps> what is hotel? Well, Robin, a hotel is good. I loved it because it was, it was hard funny, but also, like, ultimately, like, a, a, a gentle, nice show. It had a great positive message. The British creators who are actually most of the ghosts in the British series are actual the creators and writers of it. They had to approve us. So they also sent over this eternal year script just to get us approved and they, they liked it enough that they, they let us do it. So I like, I like that because like throughout your career and even trying to get in, things that may seem like failures, like this, this pilot which did not get shot and was like, okay, turned out to lead directly to Joe and I being able to do the show and eventually getting it on the air. Okay, this is huge. And it's all ours. I gotta admit, it would be nice to have a little bit of space. Exactly. New York is full of people. We're never alone. This must be them. The new folks that own the house. Can you believe this place has been in my family for six generations? She's a relative of yours, Hetty. Well, I should hope not with her exposed knees and that saucy hairdo. The first thing you ask when you're thinking about adapting something is why does this need to be adapted to American TV? What's, what's the point? You know, the British series, the, the house is occupied with, you know, British archetypes from throughout history. So if you move the show here, we will fill the house with American archetypes. And then we started talking about who would be fun to have in the house. Some of that was geographically sort of uh, dependent. And so we started like zeroing in, okay, where do we want to set this? It was a sort of a watershed moment when we were able to realistically place a Viking in upstate New York 
uh, which, is, which is there is strong evidence that they they you know they 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 were up in uh, Newfoundland I think up in up in Canada and they they kept very detailed uh, logs of their journeys down the coast and the some indicate they obviously didn't use the term New York, but like, they were like, okay, they were probably, probably sailed down. So we're like, we can realistically place a Viking. That is so much fun. That's surprising and it's technically accurate. And it was also just like, who doesn't want like a big dumb Viking running around their show yelling all the time. Why? Why? Trash can right there! When we sort of like figured that out, we're like, okay, let's do, let's do Upstick New York. There's plenty of other uh, American histories to, to draw from there as well. And then we sort of just kept talking and talking and trying to figure out who's fun, but who goes well together, what are, what are good dynamics. Uh, and we ended up with the, with the eight ghosts uh, that we have. We talked a lot about the pilot story and ultimately we decided like, it, it's such a specific premise and the British series did such a great job of setting up that premise in a believable way, which was so important to us. Like you have to buy that not only, okay, we've all seen enough stuff, we buy that there's ghosts and they exist, but get to the, get to the, get to the point where like, she can see the ghost, and the husband credibly believes that she does. Good morning, babe. Oh, good good morning. morning. Hey, last night got pretty hot, huh? No, oh, they're in here. Oh, of course they are. We basically used their first two episodes as a template. The, the major story points are all the same. There's a lot of differences because, you know, our characters have, have their own jokes and their own point of view and everything. But then we, after that, we, we both knew that, you know, ours would sort of take it. So we, we didn't want to do a carbon copy of it after that. So there was a few episodes that we definitely take inspiration from, but after that, we then wanted to basically do, do our own thing. So how did you hit the balance of Jay being that support system for Sam and making it believable for the audience? The big breakthrough we had with the, with the husband character was that not only does he believe her, but he's excited and almost jealous of it. We didn't, we didn't want him to be sort of the typical kind of sitcom husband who's just sort of like, oh, those darn ghosts again, you know, what are they? He's actually like jealous. I know you lied. But how? No, I didn't. Uh-huh, the ghost told me, and it was genuinely haunting. I was in the shower, I was nude, and then letters just appeared in the steam. Trevor. The ghost without pants is watching me shower? Gotta love that. Sam, why did you lie to me? I wanted to help you play with the ghosts, but I really don't like your favorite game. Why didn't you just tell me? Because I didn't want to upset you, and it just seemed easier to blame the ghosts. I don't care if you like playing the game or not, okay? <laughs> Objectively, you should, because it's awesome. But honestly, I just miss my friends. I know. And you have this whole group of people that, that you can talk to that I can't even see. So the other night when we were all playing together, I actually felt like I was part of the gang. That was a big breakthrough for, for us, was that like, he's all in. You know, we, and we also had, you know, there was hard evidence. She was able to, to demonstrate a few things that, aside from being like a world-class magician, she's probably actually talking to, to, to ghosts. But I think the short answer is just, you know, using the template of the, of the British series was, we were fairly confident that we could get it up and running because we also wanted to get that premise up and running. So how do you find your own originality when there's a pre-existing template for the show and for specific episodes? The best example I can think of of, of a show of, of, was a British episode that we took inspiration from was uh, Pete's Family. It was our episode five where uh, Pete's family uh, comes and Pete finds out that his wife was unfaithful to him while, that, while they were alive. And I love that British episode. I love it. It was so powerful then when he sees his grandson at the end, you know, and that was like, they nailed it. We're, we're going to do the same thing. We're hopefully we'll have our own spin on it. And, and I think we did. I think we, we changed the way in which uh, Pete found out. Sam can track him down for you. That's true. What's your wife's name? Carol Martino. Now, it's been a while, so you may need to hire a PI, track down some leads. You're going to want to go to every JCPenney, IHOP, anywhere that sells beads. Found her. Excuse me? That's her. How did you do that? I mean, it's Facebook. It's social media. We talked about the internet, right? Ooh, the thing with the cat movies? Yes, that was a very fun two days for both of us, Alberta. But Facebook is like a, it's a website that's like a bulletin board where people talk about their lives, they share photos. Wait, 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 wait. Am I to understand that this is some sort of modern day publishing instrument from which anyone can spread their message? Well, yeah. What a tool for disseminating truth. What a boon to democracy. We also changed the, the reason why uh, the family was coming. We had, we had Pete more, like, I figured, you know, now that these ghosts have Sam, they're gonna, they're gonna want stuff. And the, and the ghosts who still have family alive, I think that would be very important to them. So we, we had it where, where Pete, like, goaded Sam into 
coercing or luring or, <laughs> or, or having uh, his, his ex-wife uh, come to the house, uh, which was different than, than, than the British series. Not, I'm not saying better or anything, but it was just sort of like, I felt like that felt our storytelling uh, a little bit more. Looks like your wife still lives nearby. Oh my God. Carol, if you are listening, please visit Woodstone Mansion. Love, Pete. Uh, that's not how it works. Sam, you got to invite her for him. I mean, what would I even say? Like, hi, your dead husband lives on my property and wants to look at you? Yeah. That's, yeah. Pretty, that's pretty good. You know, so then we had the device of the, of the book, which at first was merely, that was just going to be the lore. Like that little change actually turned out to be great because as we were doing more and more drafts of, of that episode, that then turned out like the answer to, to Pete letting go and learning forgiveness came from himself from the book, which was something we added. So I thought, I think just in, in, in looking at what was the, the heart of the episode, Pete with his family, the heartbreak of finding out, and then the learning to let go, and then uh, honestly just the, the cheating of being able to see his grandkid run up, like that's like... I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking, and, it, but in, and that's gold. You had to spend a lot of time, I'm sure, bringing this cast together because you had such incredible characters that are complex, have their own desires, and to find cast members that could fill those roles, I'm sure, was quite a challenge. Can you just talk about that experience? The process is, is, is grueling. It's like you see a lot of people and a lot of talented people but who just aren't right for it. When someone comes in and it's, you're just not feeling it, it's not like that person's not a good actor or whatever. It's just like, they're just not, they're not right for it. And finding that person takes time. We were mostly cast. We were still missing a couple of people. Um, and we were shooting in a few days, which, is, which terrifyingly is actually uh, a common thing that happens on pilots. It's very nerve wracking, but it all works out somehow. And then we had our table read. And in the meantime, this, looming pandemic, like I'm, you know, was reading articles. I'm like, I don't know. And then Friday we have our table read. And then an hour later they say, go home. We're s shutting society down. So in the interim, we didn't know if that meant that was the end of the project, whatever. But then we started getting, uh, you know, Zoom auditions or mostly like recorded auditions. One of the people who, who showed up on our video screen was uh, Danielle Pinnock, who plays Alberta. Let's go, Sam. We don't have all day. OK, you literally have eternity. Oh, that's right. Thank you for reminding me of my endless purgatory. And it was immediately, like, from, from line one, it was like, oh my god, this is, she's, that was a really hard part to find because the character is bigger than life. And it felt like a lot of people who came in were doing a character. They were putting something on. And when Danielle does it, it just feels very natural and really fun. Uh, and that just came across on the audition that she put together. I love what you all do with exploring Alberta and Sasha Peace's sort of worldview and their experiences and using that to also have conversations about our current sort of social climate. Was that always part of the decision once y'all were going through the archetypes, even at those early stages? We're uh, a feel-good half-hour comedy, so we do, you know, those issues were never going to be front-facing, but we felt it would be wrong to just ignore that, ignore American history, parts of it, you know, and ignore these issues that are important to people. And, you know, and the way we do that is, like, our writing staff reflects our cast. It's like we make sure that there's representation and, and voices uh, in there so that things that are important or things that just aren't in our, our point of view are, are, are brought to our attention uh, and, and we, can, we can deal with them in a, in a sort of, you know, fair and, and, and uh, real way. You have fantastic relational dynamics between so many of the characters, including Chisholm and Higgintoot, which is one of my favorites. Isaac Higgintoot is our uh, closeted uh, Revolutionary War uh, sort of pompous uh, statesman. Going into the first season, we weren't sure. We, we, did, we didn't know that, he, that the arc was going to be he, him, him coming out. That's just something that we found along the way. Um, you know, having a character like that, we did a lot of sort of like... Uh, jokes that aren't done a lot anymore because it, it's just, you know, they, it, jokes where, like, the joke is that he's closeted but he doesn't know it and are funny and it makes sense in this, in this setup, but they were starting to get old. I think we as writers were starting to get sick of them. I think Brandon was starting to, like, you know. So we, we did the D&D &D episode where we introduced a love interest, and that, I think, is when it sort of, like, clicked on us. Like, oh, the, the arc for this episode should be Isaac 
you know, coming to terms with who he is himself and then finally being able to tell the world. And we do a little half step in where he tells uh, Hetty, which is one of my favorite scenes and episodes that we did. And that specific came about just uh, being in Montreal, being on set and seeing that Rebecca Wasaki and Brandon Scott Jones had a very like close relationship. And, and we were like, okay, let's try some scenes with them together. And this really sort of like nice friendship between these characters developed. You're planning on asking anyone special, Isaac? Like a certain British officer you murdered, perhaps? Shh, no, you are still the only one that knows about that. And no, I am not ready. Oh God, who would have thought that a prom of all things would create such a stressful social situation? And so she ended up being the first person that he, he comes out to. So I think a lot of it is uh, just watching scenes and seeing what interesting, that's the, that's the one advantage of having 10 characters is there's a lot of different pairings. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we will not purposely, but sort of like, oh, that, those two seem to pop together or that was a funny dynamic. One of my favorite dynamics ended up being Hetty and Thor. When we ended up finding out that Thor was the one who was reading lullabies to Hetty when she was a kid. Sweet little baby drift off to sleep. Dream of stabbing Danish men, laughing while they weep. When you are a warrior, you'll be strong and tall. You'll pillage villages, slit men's throats, and bash their heads against the wall. There you go, Hetty. There you go. Was that also a similar sort of build as far as that dynamic and that scene specifically? Because it just resonates so well. Yeah, that, I love that story. Uh, and I honestly cannot remember exactly how that came about. You try to find surprising things about the characters. So, you know, we would try to find soft things about Thor. The British series had an episode where they sort of revealed that uh, sometimes very young children uh, can, can see the ghosts. And we really liked that idea and thought it was really sweet. And um, it was not, I don't remember who came up with the idea that like, oh, maybe one of our ghosts could see ghosts as a small kid and maybe they would have they had a relationship you know that they didn't really re realize i don't I, honestly I, I don't remember it was just one of those it just started we st started talking about it and the heady thor thing just became it i think it's episode nine where we meet albert as a uh, stalker yeah hey sam this is todd perlman and he's uh, he's some kind of historian and he shows up at the mansion I would just love to hear, like, what was some of the inspiration behind that? Things are sort of, like, kind of form out of ether, but I think it was the idea that, like, you know, Alberta wants fame more than anything. She feels like if had she lived, she would have become the most famous singer in the world. But fame has, like, a, a dark side, you know, like, they're stalkers and, you know. So we, we just thought it was a really funny idea that, there is an Alberta Haynes super fan, and he's kind of a weirdo. <laughs> Thank you for letting me stay. It's, it's like a six-hour drive back to Altoona. What made you choose Altoona as the location for the museum? It must be a new music city. A 21st century New Orleans, no doubt. <laughs> well, uh, actually, the museum is in my garage. Ah, uh, as all the best museums are. Technically, it's my mom's garage. Oh, you live with your mom. That makes sense. Well, academics are often underpaid. <laughs> Just wait till his book comes out. So when does your book come out? Oh, it's planned for a summer release. But really, whenever. <laughs> That's the beauty of self-publishing. So yeah, we just started, uh, you know, talking out what that story would be and, you know, what the specifics are. I think... Uh, one of my favorite moments is when he reveals the Alberta Haynes uh, tattoo on his back. Oh, my God! Oh, no! uh, and then, of course, he, he came back uh, in, in, in season two. He's doing a, a podcast with Sam about uh, uh, Alberta's murder. Setting up the rules of the world very easily for the audience to digest and then breaking them or just messing with them in a bunch of different fun ways were all those rules already sort of laid out by the pre-existing show on BBC, or did you all have some affordance to do and implement your own things with your own haunted house? The basic premise and a lot of the basic rules we definitely ad adopted, but I, if you were to examine episodes, there probably is inconsistency between the two sort of like rule sets. We don't coordinate with them at all about uh, can ghosts do this, can ghosts do that. Um, but a lot of time is 
wasted and or uh, spent in the writer's room talking about like rules. And some of it, you know, none of it makes any sense. It's like, and, the, and I, our, when, when things like that happen, our, our, our sort of like remedy is to have the ghosts call it out. The ghosts are like, why don't we fall through the floor? Like, why can we walk around? Why can we sit on furniture? Short answer is these are ghosts, but we also want them to play as humans. We want, we want people to relate to them as human beings, which they probably philosophically are that have feelings and and wants and all that stuff. So I think I think that was something great that the the British series did is they decided not to have their ghosts be translucent or floating or whatever. It's like they're they're people most of the time. They do they walk through doors and walls. You know, but talking about ghost real sometimes like stories are born. There, there's a joke in season 2 where a uh, flower uh, or someone asks like, you know, like if if a wall were made out of chair material, could I not walk through it? In the room, it sort of came up, well, what if there was a material they couldn't walk through? And it was like, oh, that's, that's a great idea. Let's, let's talk about that. And we sort of talked about what could that be? What is that? And that led to uh, the vault. Can you open it? I think so. Of course, it'll take a while. Won't be cheap. Mark. Say the word. Cards on file. My crooked husband must have built this to embezzle my riches. How do you think there might be riches inside? If this thing is filled with gold coins, I am definitely going to Scrooge McDuck in them. Can one of you walk through the door and see what's in there? I'll do it. Mm -hmm. A pine cone trooper is always up for an adventure. Oh, oh, oh Peter! Oh. I've never seen that happen before. <gasps> Pete bounced off the vault door. A surface that's impenetrable to ghosts? I love it when the mythology gets expanded. Puny Pete must not be strong enough. Stand back. Oh! Oh! Well, this is mysterious. Which was a really fun episode, but it's also become now like a, a fixture of the house. We've used the vault in a couple of stories in season two. Uh, I don't think they've aired yet. Halloween did, yeah, Halloween uh, we, we did. And there's another one coming up where we, we visit the vault a lot. So talking about the ghost rules is, is always fun, but also like an opportunity to, to, to come up with, with stories. I think that's probably where we have the most sort of like inventive latitude is, is that these ghosts can each have do a specific thing. It's not like all ghosts can do this. It's, it's like, okay, Isaac farts basically when you walk through him, you know, Trevor can move things and whatnot. Again, I think, you know, anytime we, we introduce a new idea, we just have to make sure that it's, in, it's consistent with uh, the, all the stuff we've, 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 we've done before. I know it's sort of asking you to pick your favorite child, but <laughs> do you have perhaps a favorite episode the possession episode we did last year Ut utkarsh was so funny as hetty like it was just such an inspired performance what, what do you mean i'm inside of jay's body how when oh that's not mine no this isn't happening <laughs> possession isn't real possession can't be real <laughs> neither are ghosts yet here we are gather the ghosts wait a minute where are all the ghosts <gasps> oh no isaac would know what to do hey hetty or jay or Whoever. We're right here. They're right here. That's interesting. She can't see us. When we came up with it and we're shooting, we're like, is this going to be so dumb and sweaty? It's like, you don't, you don't know. But I was delighted by it when we, were, when we were putting it together. And I think it turned out really well. Did they do a lot of work so he could study her mannerisms and sort of how she performed? I think, I think it was mostly just having worked with her and watching her. I don't think he had her like do this scene and then he would, he'd, he was just doing it, you know, which was, it was so fun. Why does the show with the premise and structure like yours also have the ability to be wholesome and gravitate and resonate with so many people? I don't know. Yeah, that's probably, you know, a question for a sociologist or something. But my guess would be sort of like, you know, I feel like we very purposefully strive to find the the sweet and the happy in the show. You know, the premise is very kind of morbid. It's like it's these people who are dead and trapped. But inside that, we look for, like, the, the happy moments. We look for the relationships that are satisfying and for, you know, in, any way to sort of, like, find brightness. And that's just, like, a, you know, something that we, we like to watch and, and wanted to put out into the world. You've been watching On Writing Ghosts with Joe Wiseman on 
On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story project that also includes the On Story radio program, podcast, book series, and the On Story archive, accessible through the Whitliff Collections at Texas State University. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com. 